Secondly, Paul goes on to tell us what his spiritual authority is not based upon. And there are two things, and it's very relevant. And then thirdly, he tells us what his spiritual authority was based upon, and again, there are two things, and again, <coughs> forgive me, it is very relevant. <laughs> so let's come to what Paul's authority wasn't based on. Here is what Christian leadership, getting people to follow you, is not to be based on. This is of relevance to us for two reasons. Firstly, because we need to know who to follow. And secondly, because every one of us, because we believe in mission or church, needs to be a person that other people will want to follow in following Jesus. Everybody happy? Here's what your spiritual authority, your leadership, is not to be based upon. There are authority sources rejected in verses 12 to 14. They will work, but they are to be rejected. Here's what Christian leadership is not to be based on. Verses 12 to 14. Now let me fill in the background. There's a lot of talk in the contemporary American Reformed Church scene about leadership. They really focus on leadership. They really want to be a leader. You've got these good old American boys, you know, or good young American boys, and they, and they want to be a leader. And leadership is what they tweet and blog and all the time. I feel sorry for their wives, in some ways. It's all a bit butch. I'm afraid some of it sounds like what Paul rejects here, so, so let me explain. There's a lot of talk that goes on about developing and exerting, here's the word, influence. That's the word they use. To influence people. So to be an influencer, you need to get a good following on Twitter, of course. You need to get a lot of people reading your blog yeah. and leaving extremely complimentary comments, although that would be nice, but, but that's the big deal. Have you noticed the way folks in this mindset really go a big deal on complimenting people to be well thought of and getting compliments to be well thought of? It's like uh, bidding on somebody's sheep. You know, the, uh, Big NSA is coming up, the big sales and bills are coming up shortly. And uh, you know that somebody is going to bid 4,000 guineas on that sheep. And you look at that sheep and you'll think, that sheep's not worth 4,000 guineas. And then you realise that that guy then sells a the sheep and the other guy buys his sheep for 3,000 guineas. So he's paid 1,000 guineas for this sheep. But it's created a stir. It's 4,000 guinea sheep. See how it works? And that works with this complimenting one another as well if you're not very careful. To be an influencer, you need to be in all that sort of stuff. In a lesser way, I remember being spoken to by two very fine Welsh evangelical ministers on this side of the pond, very early on in my career, about the importance of going to conferences and fraternals and making a name for yourself. Sitting on committees. Two good guys. Now, for two guys who decried the idea of professionalism in the ministry, even way back then, this struck me as rather odd. Look at what Paul rejects here as undergirdings for authority in ministry. A good impression. Seeking a good impression. Verse 12. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. They want to create a good impression. Now beware of that in your Christian witness. Wanting to create a good impression for yourself outwardly. If you're always using Twitter to show how well you run your family and raise your kids, to publicise what a good lad you are by publicising your mountain biking exploits or touring bike rides, or to cast yourself as a keen sports fan and one of the boys and what you actually need to be as one of God's servants, isn't there a danger that you might have fallen into the trap of wanting to make a good impression over you? It doesn't authenticate ministry. And are you doing it to fit in rather than to commend the gospel faithfully and accept the alienation and the persecution that comes your way when you do that? In a sense, amongst our non-Christian friends, as Christians, we're going to be a loner. We're going to stand out. We need to be aware of those who seek to wield spiritual influence or build their leadership in inverted commas by making a good impression outwardly because that is something that Paul wants no piece of at all. After all, come on, he just said about addressing them in baby handwriting. Is this a guy who's trying to make a good impression? Paul is the opposite of all that stuff. 
But of course it gets worse than that, you see. Because preachers who try to lead you by communicating that they are somebody are denying the basic truths of the Gospel. Because the basic, basic truths of the Gospel say that I am a nobody trying to point fellow sinners to someone who alone really is somebody. Did I say that too fast? And what should we listen to? Is the Gospel of God's free grace to lost sinners, of which I am chief, says Paul somewhere else, is that gospel really served by preachers who jack their reputations up to make themselves out to be somebody? Soon. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah, I am jealous, really, because I haven't got a lot of hair to cut. <laughs> I'm aware of these things. But this is an issue. Be careful. Don't follow these people, says Paul, because at this important part they are not following Christ, says Galatians 6, 12-14. They want to make a good impression of it. And none of that is about exercising proper spiritual authority and leadership in the church. Now, leadership in the church is a biblical thing. It's the right thing. But that's not the way it comes. This isn't the way to do it. Going this way is about subverting the rule of God in his church. By getting a following for yourself, when you should be concentrating on getting a following for Jesus. Is that serious? It is serious. And that's clearly what Jesus, what, what Paul lays at the door of the Judeos, is getting a following for themselves rather than a following for Jesus. More than that, these guys are doing it for a dodgy reason. They're doing it to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. They're not willing to stand out from the in crowd. They're not doing it to commend Christ, they're doing it to safeguard their cool reputation and to avoid the pain involved in radically following Christ. Do you know, there's a lot of mere pain avoidance that goes on in the way Christians set about giving a good outward appearance. You read through John 13 to 17. Oh, you've been doing that recently, haven't you? And you'll see Jesus is not about pain avoidance. He's about mission fulfillment. I'm afraid there's a lot of this contextualising the message and making it relevant and being cool that actually smacks a lot more of making it painless for the popularity-seeking Christian who's seeking popularity with the crowd and not with Christ. Now that is no excuse for being odd. Christians shouldn't have to be odder than they have to be. Come on, we've got to be odd enough as it is, haven't we? I read a book last week uh, called Weird. So I recommend this book, everybody, you, young people in particular, but especially old people like me as well. It's a book called Weird, because normal isn't working. It's good, just good read. And it's about how we need to be distinctive for Christ. Really, a good, a good title sort of 50 years ago would have been Holiness. Because that's what he's getting at. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to be weird. That's a good book. Anyway, I've done the plug. The trouble is that all too often, making the gospel clear, making its implications obvious, is going to make non-Christians uncomfortable with where their life is at the moment. We can do that nicely. But that's what's going to happen. And just trying to make Jesus cool is only going to be always going to be tempting for anyone who won't live with his teaching. Teaching like this in Matthew 10, for example. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. A student is not above his teacher. Who's our teacher? Ultimately, Jesus is our teacher. We're not above him, nor a servant above his master. And what did he have to do with it? And he winds up that teaching in Matthew 10 28. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of not looking cool. Respectability. Cool. A desire to have influence. They all easily lead to avoiding persecution for the cross of Christ. And as Paul will point out, and as he points out elsewhere, what we suffer for the name is what authenticates what we say about Jesus. It gives authority. Paul rejects giving a good impression outwardly to try and get a hearing to get some authority for what he says. 
And Paul rejects self-glorification as a way of authenticating and getting authority through what we say. These Judaizers want to big up their ministry on the basis of the ritual observances, the religious hoops they've got these people to jump through. The Judaizers feel they're significant people because they've got these primitive people to get circumcised, to make themselves feel bigger. But what they've settled upon to make themselves feel bigger is a ritual. It is a ritual. They've focused on a ritual. And that ritual has been given a significance by them that it can't sustain. And that happens a lot around churches. We give rituals a significance that they cannot sustain. Now, there may be fancy dress rituals, there may be bells and smells rituals, or there may be completely other rituals altogether. There may be contemporary musical rituals, or there may be cont contemporary dance rituals, or running around with flags rituals, or have you been in churches like that? Have you been to one? We'll have a trip. We'll have a, we'll have a church trip and go and see what happens. Yes, it broadens your horizons, I can tell you, to travel someplace. I'll be the fastest. You'll be the fastest running around with a flag, will you, Carl? Thank you very much. <laughs> I have confidence in you. Some churches even have big flags for big people and little flags for little people. And you can all have a run around together. And we don't poke each other's eye out, I suppose it's okay. But we have our rituals. And we give them a significance that they can't sustain. In seeking to make a good impression outwardly. And what these people are doing is then they glorify themselves on that basis. In these areas, we find no source of spiritual authority, not in creating influence out of making a good impression, nor in public self-glorification. No, says Paul, true gospel authority, which he claims, is based in gospel truth and gospel self-sacrifice, persevering in Christ's service when it costs you.